Hello everyone, we are so glad you have stopped by our YouTube channel. Through the years, we have gathered many wonderful sermons, and we decided we should share them with you. If you enjoy, we ask you would like, comment, and subscribe. Please leave a comment telling us what your favorite part of the sermon is. Also, since some of the recordings are from cassette tape, we do not have all the information. If you have information on the recording, please leave it in the comment. Thank you, and may God bless you. And I am grateful for what God has done in your life, and I am excited as I look toward the horizon with you to understand, amen, that there is some fresh troops that are fixing to hit the battlefield. More excited than seeing National Guard troops come to L.A. to help weary, battle-ravished policemen and firemen that had been shot at, picked apart, and everything else. I'm excited of what I see coming out of the academy here in Houston, Texas. For the work of God, for the kingdom of God, and I commend you so much for your hard work. And if you're not graduating, amen, for the years of hard work that's still ahead of you here, learning and applying, you will never, I promise you, look back. Hear me. You'll never look back and wish you had spent less time at Bible school. Amen. So you will look back and you will value and cherish, amen, all of the time that you spent and all of the learning and everything that went into making you prepared for the master's business. And I am excited, amen, for you here tonight. First Kings chapter 19, I want to read to you there the story that I'm sure most of you know ever so well. You could probably all preach about it here tonight, but ha-ha, it's my turn. <laughs> First Kings chapter 19, beginning at verse number 9, the scripture said, He came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, break in pieces the rocks before the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus, when thou comest anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Jehu the son of Nimshi shall thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of of Shaphat, of Abel, Melhola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth 
the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. Him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. I want to preach to you tonight on this subject, the mount of God, no place for burnout. The mount of God, no place for burnout. You say, Brother White, we're young, just getting started. What are you talking about? As for them folks with arthritis and bursitis and all them other things wrong with them that could be imagined, that's something that happens later on in ministry, in years of labor and toil and sweat and blood and tears. I got news for you, friend. It didn't happen to Elisha or Elijah later on in ministry, and it comes very early in ministry, and it comes even while you're in Bible school, the beginning of it begins to set in and with the help of the almighty God I want you to pray with me that God would anoint me to help each one of you amen to leave out of here tonight amen commit it amen that you are not going to burn out but you have started out and you're going to finish the race that you begun Amen. Would you pray with me now, dear God? I praise and honor and worship, magnify and exonerate your name, God. The singing has blessed us. We've reveled in your glory. Hallelujah. We've been strengthened, secured by you in this service, God. Blessed by exhortation. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, I am praying, deal with every young lady, with every young man, God, with every young person in this Bible college, God. Hallelujah, let your mighty spirit place a capstone upon this weekend. Let the glory of God be manifested. I'm praying, I'm believing, I'm asking. Oh, God, grant it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. Praise God. The mount of God. No place for burnout. I have a whole lot of territory that I'd like to cover tonight. So I trust that you will understand with me without dealing upon that subject matter, as the Scripture informs us that we are come unto Mount Zion, that the church of the living God, amen, is the Mount of God. It is the place where we have come as God's people for His work, for His purpose, for His calling, for His mission he left what was called a commission he wanted us to join in together with the mission that he had to be co-workers with him in that tremendous mission that was there and in the life of Elijah a tremendous prophet of God whom we have heard comments concerning him the great things that God allowed and did for him in life. His life was such a symbol for us to look at and extract some beautiful things from the Word of God. He came onto the scene in the midst of a time 
of tremendous turmoil that was going on among the people of God. Old King Compromise by the name of Ahab was the king that had ascended unto the throne. And if it is if his weakness and his spineless condition was not bad enough, he had a wife by the name of Jezebel that stoked and fed his fires every night when he got home, letting him to know that all of the old fogey ways of these Israelites and their worshiping of their God is no longer in vogue. There are new dimensions that we need to climb to Ahab. And there are marvelous spiritual experiences that are waiting that I've experienced off with worshiping other gods. And he came upon the scene and the almighty God allowed this man who was prone, as we'll learn tonight, he was prone to get a martyr complex that he was the only one that really cared about true righteousness, about the real plan and purpose of the Almighty God. And so the Lord allowed his path to come across the pathway of a man by the name of Obadiah. Obadiah happened to be working right in the palace of old Ahab. And Obadiah, in the midst of all of that, was still hanging on to the bloodstained banner, was still standing up for truth and righteousness, was risking his life by taking the prophets of God and placing them inside of a cave and there providing them with food, providing them with water, and securing their safety as Jezebel sought to kill all of them. And God allowed Elijah to meet him and to run across him to let him to know that there still is somebody else, amen, that's involved in my program. Don't forget it, Elijah. You're not in this thing alone. That's not cause for you to give up. That's not cause for you to back down or to run out of steam or to run out of zeal for what you see around you. Just trust me that there are others that are as committed unto this thing as what you are. And so he began his ministry with the beautiful task of coming and calling on the carpet the new God on the block by the name of Baal. That had come to Israel. He was known and highly touted as being the God of fire and the God of rain. And the Almighty God said, we'll play it right on your turf. Elijah, I want you to go. And in the midst of that God that is so proud of the things he thinks he controls, uh, I want you to first of all deliver the message to Ahab that there will be no rain uh, until. Hallelujah. There will be no rain uh, until the only God who controls the spigot up there decides to turn it back on. Uh, sorry about that, Baal. You can try all you want, uh, but for the next three and a half years, you are going to be have your understanding enlightened uh, that our God, Jehovah God, is really the God of rain. Hallelujah. And so Elijah began the task and the ministry that was before him. And the heavens were dried up. His brook dried up. The widow was there at Zarephath to take care of him and to feed him during his time of need. The Lord saw that 
finally Baal and Jezebel and Ahab and everybody else was convinced that, that Baal wasn't the God of rain and said, now we're going to take him to task on the other part of his prowess and of his power. And that's to see who truly is the God of fire. And so up to Mount Carmel they came. A tremendous story that excites me every time I read about it. A new and a fresh. Uh, and the beautiful results up on that mountain uh, of the tremendous things that happened there. And the almighty God vindicating himself over the power that Baal thought he had. That the false prophets of Baal were convinced that their God had. They pleaded, they cried, they begged. He mocked and made fun of them just to rub a little salt in the wound. And finally it happened. The only God that is the God of fire sizzled down out of glory the fire to lap up the waterlog sacrifice uh, and to burn it all up. Uh, and 450 of Baal's prophets uh, were killed that day. Uh, and Ahab stood, uh, a man whose ministry had now had God's touch upon it uh, and the blessing of God upon it. Uh, he was so excited. Uh, hallelujah. He, he about jumped out of his skin. Hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, nobody can describe uh, what it feels like to be divinely used of God uh, to accomplish a work uh, that a sovereign God chooses uh, to do through a mortal man. Uh, he thought he was bionic, my friend. Uh, he took off in front of that chariot uh, for 23 miles, uh, a running in front uh, of old Ahab. Ahab's chariot. Uh, I am sure laughing and skipping uh, and having himself a big time uh, saying, whoa, look who's got all the power. Look what God has all uh, of the anointing. Look whose touch uh, the Lord is on. Uh, and what an exciting, exhilarating thrill uh, that it was to be a anointed of God. But the next chapter tells us the same old guy, the same fella with all of that unction all over him, with all that anointing all over him, starts shaking and quaking about a little story he hears about Jezebel that's going to come and take care of him. I mean, if he just could have remembered about God's display of firepower up there on the mountain, he would have thought, now God, if you want to make a crispy critter out of her, let her try to touch me. Let her try to mess with me. Uh, but instead, he's over there uh, just shaking, and he decides, the Scripture said, that he wants to isolate himself. Uh, and the lone ranger leaves Tonto back on the other side uh, and says, I want to go off over here all by myself uh, and just think about the scenario for a little while. Isn't it amazing when we're down, the last thing we want is an audience? When, when, when we're feeling, uh, you know, just kind of at them stages we, we don't want anybody around uh, you know they say misery loves company uh, but when we're the one that's miserable we don't want anybody to see how low that we can get uh, 
in them low, low moments. Uh, over he goes underneath a juniper tree. He sits down under that juniper tree uh, and he just decides uh, that his ministry is all over. He makes the decision. I mean, he's barely got out of the starting blocks and he makes the decision real quick uh, that every dog has his day. And I, I guess this pig's had his day in the sun, God. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I know what it's like. I've done something great for you. Uh, but like a shooting star, I guess it's time for you to take me on home. Uh, because I done did all that I can do. Uh, and just go ahead. Just, just let me die, God. Uh, I have made my contribution uh, to the church of the living God. Uh, and oh, what a splash I made. God said, splash, son. What's wrong with you? I, I got plenty of work left uh, that I need your involvement in. Uh, I got all kinds uh, of things that are yet to be done uh, that desperately need you involved. Uh, and he goes over there and he crashes. Have you ever noticed how depression and sleep go hand in hand? He just crashes out underneath that old juniper tree uh, and he decides to sleep. Uh, now, now let me explain to you something here. Amen. God understands our physical limitations. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm preaching about here tonight, uh, to think we're all just to push ourselves physically until we end up with a nervous breakdown or end up uh, totally shot and collapsed out somewhere. God understands our physical limitations uh, and he showed it uh, with what he did uh, with Elijah. He said, there you are, Elijah. Amen. Sleep, you're needing a little bit of it. Uh, I mean, if you ran 23 miles, uh, you would need a uh, cut a few Z's too, wouldn't you? God said, I understand all about it. Uh, just sit there, have a good night, night, son. Uh, I'll see you in the morning. Uh, in the morning time, he wakes up uh, and starts sniffing around uh, and says, hmm, somebody's got breakfast going for me. He looks over there and the angel's bringing the flapjacks off of the griddle. Uh, and saying boysenberry syrup or maple uh, which one do you like uh, Elijah Elijah said man alive uh, this retirement party's getting better and better uh, he, he woofed it all down licked his chops uh, and he decided uh, he was going to go back to sleep again you ever get that hog spirit, you know, on Sunday afternoon? Uh, amen. When you just ate a big old meal uh, and said, I, I just need to go back uh, and enjoy this some more. And there he went. Uh, amen. God didn't shake him and kick him and say, you, you lazy boy bum you get on your feet uh, quit sleeping on the job uh, let me tell you rest is approved by god hey man god knows our frame he knows that we're but flesh uh, so i'm not preaching against that here tonight uh, i want you to understand uh, there are times that we become physically exhausted uh, and the lord wants us uh, to get our physical body recharged uh, and rejuvenated uh, and everything just fine uh, and elijah went back to sleep uh, and the angel pulled the blackout shades and said sleep on son sleep on pretty good so far huh 
Amen. You're hoping I'm going to end my sermon right there, aren't you? <laughs> that, woo, we do got a good God, Brother White. Uh, he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, if he thinks about all of that, just like that. Uh, the angel finally spoke to him uh, and said, I, I've got something for you to do. Uh, there's places for you to go and people for you to see. Uh, and you better get up and eat again, uh, for there is a long journey in front of you. Uh, he ate of the food again, nourished his body, and he set out on a 40-day journey uh, when he got there to the mount that the Scripture said uh, was Mount Horeb. Uh, when he got there, the Bible said that he lodged himself uh, inside of a cave uh, that was there at Mount Horeb. Horeb. Uh, he came uh, and the word of the Lord came unto him. Uh, the Almighty God said, I ain't just letting an angel come uh, and talk to you now, Elijah. He said, because it seems like that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding uh, as to what uh, and how long this R and R is supposed to last. Uh, it seems like uh, that you have discharged yourself from the duties of the Lord uh, a long time before I ever discharged you. Uh, and I want to talk to you. You see, he had rested. Uh, he had been fed. Uh, he had had time off. Uh, but he still wasn't ready to go back on duty. Have you ever had a vacation that just didn't last long enough? <laughs> At the end of the summer vacation, you thought, my, 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 I just need one more week of this. Uh, I just need about two more weeks of this. Uh, anymore, I can squeeze. I'm not sure I'm going back to Bible college uh, because this gets to feeling too good. Uh, I, I'm telling you, just kicking back uh, and all of my studies being over with uh, and everything is just rosy. The Almighty God saw that what began as a physical need in Elijah's body had turned into a spiritual infection that was going, uh, amen, to destroy him uh, if the Almighty God uh, couldn't get his attention and get him back out on the battlefield uh, doing what he was supposed to do uh, for the Almighty God. Uh, the Lord looked at Elijah and he said, Elijah, I got a question for you. He said, what are you doing here? That's what he said. Amen. He said, what are you doing here, son? Amen. Isn't it strange that when we take ourselves out of ministry, that God wants to know why? Isn't it strange that when we park ourselves, disengage ourselves, from involvement in his marvelous kingdom that the Almighty God says, I deserve to know why you're sitting down on the job. I deserve to know why in the In so many words, uh, he said, now God, he said, I, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, amen. When I was out there working my finger to the bone, nobody would help me. And since I was the only one willing to work at it uh, and give it all that I had, I guess I deserve some time off, don't I? All the rest of them 
backslidden cowards. All the rest uh, of them young people in that youth group uh, that I have tried so hard to get them uh, spiritual and to get great things happening. Uh, when it came time for the prayer meetings, uh, I and only I showed up, uh, amen, to pray. Uh, when it came time that I called the day of fasting, uh, I caught them sneaking pizza in the back door door uh, of the church uh, when it came time uh, for really spiritual things God uh, nobody would help me uh, and I just slaved and slaved and slaved all by myself uh, and since I did you know God uh, I got a little tired of it uh, now if you got a bone to pick with anybody God uh, go pick it with them but of lazy nincompoops that wouldn't do anything. Uh, go pick on them. Don't pick on me. Uh, I've done my share. God said, Elijah, <laughs> he said, I heard that flimsy little excuse you just gave me. Maybe you didn't understand what I said. I didn't say, what are they doing? I said, what are you doing here? I'm not dealing with them and their problems and their uninvolvement. I'm dealing with you, biggin. Come on out of this cave uh, and talk with me uh, just a little bit. Uh, because I want to call you to task uh, on your early retirement party that you've thrown for yourself uh, and you hadn't consulted me uh, one little bit about it. Uh, and the Bible lets us to know uh, that things begin to rock and shake and quake around there and a wind and an earthquake and a fire and a still small voice uh, and that's where most preachers just in the text man we can preach about that still small voice or that earthquake that fire and that that everything i never heard anybody explain what did the still small voice say hmm. have you you probably hadn't either <laughs> the still small voice repeated itself and said what are you doing here I've called you I've anointed you I've used you so far enough for you to know that my hand is upon you that my power and my blessing is with you and here you are in the hour of greatest need in the kingdom of God. You're burned out, nursing your little wounds back in the back of a cave in the mountain here instead of out mixing it up in the thick of it, uh, doing what God uh, wanted you to do. Uh, and Elijah repeated it again. I don't think with quite as much unction the second time. He said, now God, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. He said, I, even I, I'm the only one fighting against Baal. I'm the only one. And when I was out there, you telling me that, that there's others now willing to help me out. Uh, there's others willing to get involved. Uh, I, I know, last I know, it was just me, God, and think of the good things that I've done for you. Quit picking on me, God, for the things that I'm not doing. It's kind of amazing when God deals with us, how that we can point out all of the good things that we've done for him and just ignore what he's trying to say to us. I copied down a little letter that so illustrates this so beautifully. 
a college girl, she wrote it home to her mother. It said, Dear Mom, since I've been away at college for one full semester, I think it's about time that I bring you up to date on what's going on. Shortly after I arrived at college, I got bored with dormitory life and stole $10 out of my roommate's purse. And with that money, I rented a Honda bike and crashed it into a telephone pole a few blocks from college. I broke my leg but was rescued by the gorgeous young doctor who lives upstairs in the apartment house on the corner. He took me in, nursed me back to health, set my leg, and thanks to him, I'm up and around again. We wanted to let you know that we're going to get married as soon as possible. Since we're having some trouble on the blood test, because there is the disease that keeps showing up, we do hope, however, that we will be married before the baby arrives and that we will be home shortly thereafter to live with you and Dad. I know that you will love the baby as much as you have loved me, even though it will be of a different religion. But please try to understand the reason that we're having to come home and stay is because my doctor friend wants out of medical school because of all the attention that he has had to give my condition. Really, Mom, I didn't steal $10 out of my roommate's purse or rent a Honda bike or hit a telephone pole or break my leg. I did not meet a young doctor of a different religion, nor are we going to get married. There is no disease or test or baby to worry about. And I won't be home to live with you and Dad, and he won't be either. However, I am getting a D in geometry and an F in geology. And I wanted you to accept these grades in their proper perspective. <laughs> it's amazing how innovative we can get, isn't it? Now, God, uh, I, I'm not cutting my hair. I'm not wearing mini skirts. I'm not putting on makeup. I'm not, amen, running around in bikinis, tank tops. I'm not involved in bar hopping, having myself a time and going down to the parties and doing all that. However, I am flunking in evangelism. And I am getting a D in involvement, but God, I just wanted you to accept it in the right perspective. I'm still paying my tithes, God. Yeah. I still believe one God. I, I hadn't gone to the Trinities yet. No, 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 that's for somebody else, not me. Uh, I, 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 haven't, I haven't gone charismatic I'm, you don't have to worry about me. Uh, I'll, I'll have to admit, God, I ain't doing much for your kingdom back in this cave. But don't forget, hold the fort is still my song. Uh, and I'm still believing it uh, and hanging in there. I'm rooted and grounded in the doctrine that I got at TBC. Uh, and bless God, uh, I shall not be moved uh, and God said yeah that's a problem uh, me and a tow truck and a logging chain uh, is trying to get you moved uh, I'm trying to drag your carcass uh, out of that stinking cave uh, that you got yourself holed up in uh, I'm trying to get you out uh, on the battlefield son uh, where you belong uh, out there proclaiming truth uh, and driving bail out of the land and, uh, and tearing down the groves. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Amen. God brought Elijah to the point of realization that unless you get yourself involved again, amen, you are going to be destroyed. The word Horeb, if you look it up in your Hebrew dictionary, the word Horeb means desolate. It was the same mountain that is also called Mount Sinai. The exact place where Moses up in that same mountain earlier, maybe in the same exact cave, had got a hold of the power of the Almighty God and had received the commandments of God for all generation. But while one was tuning in with God, what God knew uh, that at the bottom of that same mountain, uh, at the same exact time, uh, the group that would not get involved uh, in what God was doing uh, was now building a golden calf, uh, was now uh, taking the jewelry, uh, was now dancing around uh, to the tune of a different drummer, was now involving themselves uh, in all of their false worship uh, and their idolatry. Uh, I will tell you something, my friend. Uh, at the mount of God, uh, you and and I will make one of two choices. Uh, we will either involve ourselves uh, with all our might, uh, with all our strength uh, in worshiping the one true living God, uh, or we will digress uh, into worshiping uh, the false gods of this world, uh, involving ourselves uh, in picking up paganism, uh, in picking up idolatry, uh, and committing spiritual whoredoms uh, in stripping ourselves uh, of the clothing of modesty. Uh, the same mountain uh, where the glory is shaken uh, and the power of God is moving uh, is the same mountain uh, that's leaving some of them desolate. Amen. God called it the provocation. You see, we serve a God that knows a human being must have air or he can't survive. He must have water to drink or he can't make it. He must have food to sustain him or he cannot live. And he also must have a God that he is actively serving. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, hear me as I talk to you, uh, that there's no place for burnout uh, at the mount of God. Uh, there's no way to shift it in neutral. There's no way uh, to cool your heels for a little while. Uh, you will be actively serving uh, one God or another. You will uh, be actively involved uh, in something or another that you are doing. Uh, it's absolutely, without question, uh, impossible. Uh, we're living in a society nowadays uh, where people uh, are becoming uh, involved in all kinds uh, of new age and humanistic uh, and all kinds of things out there. I'm not worried about them. Uh, I'm preaching about, uh, I know they got to have a God, uh, but I'm preaching about the people of God uh, that once knew what it was like uh, to stand on a mountain called Carmel uh, and bury their face before God uh, and have red hot prayer meetings uh, where the Almighty God came down uh, and met them in a glorious way. Uh, 
when they place themselves uh, inside a cave uh, of uninvolvement. Uh, there is a danger of desolation uh, that their life starts to evolve uh, around their job. Uh, it starts to evolve uh, around making money. Uh, it starts to evolve uh, around the various golden calves uh, that society has to offer. It starts getting them uh, to dancing to that tune, uh, to doing all they can uh, to get involved in that. Uh, and God said, it makes me so angry that my glory is at that same mountain. Uh, but you got weary uh, with active involvement in my kingdom. Uh, and you got your focus turned uh, to some other area that became more important to you. I had the privilege of going to a Christian school my three high school years that was connected with the Bible college. So all in all, I was seven years at that Bible college. And I had the privilege of observing from 10th grade on various classes of Bible school students as they would come through. I noticed patterns that began to be very apparent to me even as a young man. I noticed the zeal and the zip and the fire, the commitment and the involvement that I saw when young men and young ladies came their freshman year. I listened in the prayer room whoo, to prayers that'll rattle the gates of hell. I listened and I saw their zeal and their fire. And I watched them saying, young people, now I ain't preaching about any of you around here, so you just have to forgive me. I don't know anything about your pattern. By the time they came back their second year, a lot of them had a little different air about them when they came back then. They wasn't really trying to impress anybody anymore with how spiritual they were, so they kind of had uh, settled in a little bit in the ministry, you know. They, they had uh, kind of made a little name for themselves, and uh, things were just a little bit better. They knocked a home run or two you know, when they had a chance to preach last year. And, you know, the president of the Bible college already knew they had the goods. So there wasn't nobody to really impress. And they just kind of found themselves a little spot headed toward the cave. By the time most of them got to be seniors, I guess they took their cue. I'm talking about seven years of watching, all right? By the time most of them got to be seniors, I guess they took their cues out of watching 65 and 70 and 80-year-old preachers because instead of being the fire brands that they once were, amen, jumping and screaming and shouting and dancing and hollering, they kind of kicked back and kind of gave it that, you know, when it was, really hopping hot you know amen brother that's good preaching brother yeah. yeah oh man that was good stuff and it used to be <laughs> hallelujah amazing how much arthritis they'd gotten just a couple of years huh amazing well i'm just getting a little old and matured and i'm mellowing out you know and still water runs deep you know don't equate stillness with maturity my friend mud puddles are still too So the journey toward the cave doesn't just happen 
after you all wore out from fighting the devil and saints and the beast of Ephesus and everything. You look at preachers at General Conference, and dear God, hey man, they're not dried up. They're worn out, that general board. Uh, I mean, after all the devils they fought, uh, hey man, come on. Some of us need to do some of the shouting for them and, hey man, get all excited about it. But, but instead it's, oh, that's how it's done. You wear those kind of ties that have the right labels on it. You get the right kind of socks that got just a, yeah. We used to call them Urshanites, you know, when I was in school. Those, those just right kind of socks with the right ribs on them because we saw Brother Urshan wear them one time huh, when he came out there to Bible school. And uh, you know, that, that, that's what it took, you know, to to really get to be something in the kingdom of God. Uh, just, amen. Bring me a rocking chair, Lord. I, I made my mark up on Mount Carmel. And now I'm already established. I'm not a rookie around here anymore. I'm. Dear God, we need to have a necktie party, don't we? <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. And I watched them old jokers through the years. Uh, and I thought, my, my, I thought Bible school, uh, amen, was like getting them charged up with nuclear fuel, you know. Uh, and every year they got some more and some more and some more of it uh, and some more power and some more zeal uh, and some more anointing uh, to where when it was time for a liftoff, buddy, they wasn't running on half empty. Uh, they had all, all that it took uh, to get them going into orbit. Uh, but instead, uh, amen, it looked to me like the pattern was kind of the opposite. Like a dud of a Roman candle on July 4th. It kind of fizzed out. Oh, don't. Don't hang that on us, Brother White. You just don't understand. Uh, we've replaced all of that zeal and that fire with this awesome knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and homiletics and hermeneutics. Uh, and we got it all down pat. We don't spit and sputter like an outboard motor anymore when we get up to preach. Uh, no, 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 no. It's not in that anymore. Uh, it's in the content of what we have to say. Uh, amen. And oh, brother, we got all kinds of content. Uh, amen. So back into the cave, you start digressing early on in your ministry. Yeah. Until finally, you just kind of get the feeling, hey man, that all of those things that I did early on isn't really where it's at. You know, early on, all them days of fasting that I do, I've found the slickest <laughs> woo, little improvement for that that you could ever imagine. It's called the tape club. <laughs> yeah. And all them hours of praying that I used to think God required out of me uh, to really be able to shuck the corn uh, and to be able to do it. Guess what, man? If you get on enough tape of the month clubs uh, all across United States, man, there's conventions going everywhere, and I'll get a hold of something that somebody doesn't know. Uh, hey, man, uh, and oh, I can preach that, and they'll rub my back, and they'll say, yeah, man, that was somebody fine preaching you did. Woo! Uh, woo! Uh, 
Man, you really learned a bunch, didn't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When's the next sectional youth rally coming up? Hey Amen. I, I, I got something there. Uh, and the things uh, that were once drilled into you, uh, that this is important for involvement. Uh, you can't lose an ounce of your zeal. Uh, you can't lose a bit of your prayer life. Uh, I got to watching uh, those same young men uh, that would scream and cry their guts out uh, to the early morning hours, uh, their first year in school. Uh, you couldn't find them in the prayer room uh, their last year. Uh, you couldn't find them uh, agonizing before God. Uh, you couldn't find them uh, missing out from the cafeteria to spend time uh, on a three-day fast uh, because they wanted to get a hold of God. Uh, they wanted to do something for God. Uh, they kind of felt like uh, they had already paid their dues. Yeah, that's what Elijah thought. I paid my dues, God, to this thing. Yeah, and here I am just enjoying a few of the perks that come along with this rocking chair back here. I'm looking at some of the most tremendous musical talent and singing talent that I've ever seen of these young ladies and young men that I've heard played instruments and sing and glorify God. Amen. And if you're not careful, it gets to the place uh, that what you're striving for, amen, what you're really wanting bad uh, is to write just that special song, uh, to get just that right invitation, uh, to get notoriety. If I can ever make it to singing uh, at General Conference at the Harvest Time Song Fest, baby, uh, there ain't no higher high than that. Uh, and if I can just get there uh, man that's it uh, hallelujah but I'm telling you the same prayer uh, the same fasting uh, the same devotion uh, that it took uh, for you to get that song anointed of God uh, it's going to take the same thing uh, continuing the rest of your life uh, the rest of your walk uh, the rest of your journey uh, if you want the almighty God uh, to lay his mantle upon you uh, and his mighty presence uh, I'm telling you there are no shortcuts uh, you will burn out uh, if you stop praying uh, you will burn out uh, if you stop fasting uh, you will burn out uh, if you stop digging in the word and I watched young people I'm not too many years out of Bible school now and I watched young men that by the time I graduated, amen, the numbers had slimmed way, way down of them uh, that were still willing to do the basics uh, to keep up their consecration to God. Uh, I could tell you the names of guys, uh, amen, that could out-preach me all the way through Bible school, uh, hands down without any question, uh, could razzle-dazzle the crowd, uh, could do all kinds uh, of theatrics that, that was ever more in demand uh, everywhere, but somehow they thought uh, that I can quit doing that uh, and still remain at the Mount of God uh, and keep on mechanically uh, performing my functions. Uh, I'm telling you, they're backslid tonight. Uh, their homes are blown apart. Uh, they're pastoring charismatic churches. Uh, they don't have the goods. Uh, they don't love this precious truth uh, that was drilled inside of us. Uh, they gave it up one day. Uh, there are singers uh, all across uh, the United States. Uh, there are many that live in L.A. Uh, and perform in Hollywood uh, that once sang uh, in tour groups uh, that once went across all our country. Uh, United Pentecostal Church. Uh, talent uh, that was tremendously used uh, and blessed to God. Uh, but one day uh, they crawled in a cave uh, and quit 
doing what God required out of them. And they became desolate, dancing around a golden calf, doing choreography in church instead of apostolic dancing like we've been doing around here. Amen. They became desolate at their golden calf. 